Well, um, imagine you, you give a TED talk and then two years later they ask you back to, for a poop story. Give me more on the poop story. So I thought, well, that, that much for my scientific career. But um, as you can see in my Twitter profile that my third job is um, innovation inspired, you know, sustainability uh, as, a, as, a, as a thing to carry out. Uh, my outreach and uh, sustainable innovation inspired by nature. And so, uh, so I thought I'm going to give you the, the poop story. Maybe that's also part of human nature. So, you know, that we, we want to know everything about our poop. We think we're not animals, but I think we want to know everything about our poop. So I'm going to give you the poop story. And, um, but just to get back to 2009, um, I actually argued that the destruction of bio of biodiversity and ecosystems that are so important for us is really the result of a design flaw that we can fix. We're just living in the wrong economy. We're living in an economy that is linear, that is a flow from something we take, we make something out of it, and we destroy it. And that is very unlike nature. I think it is um, the wrong idea technology. It's an ideology that is in our brain, according to Professor Swart. Now, when we live in that linear economy, we are uh, destroying our resources. And there's lots of resources that you may have heard of, rare metals, etc. But one I want to point at is uh, the phosphor story. Phosphorus is uh, a very precious element that is in our body, in, in the body or every living organism in your DNA, it's in your blood, it's in your bones. Uh, it's an important factor for your energy. And uh, it's, it's irreplaceable. There's nothing else we can have in our DNA than that uh, phosphorus. But it's also uh, something that is not renewable. We can't pull it out of the air like nitrogen. It is something that we must get from somewhere else. And we get it from the geological um, reserves in, in, in phosphorus rock. And phosphorus rock is something that we find in, uh, in a selection of countries, and there's only a few countries really that we get it out a lot. Now, phosphorus is also an important factor for the growing of our crops, and of course, therefore, it is an important component of artificial fertilizer. I'll tell you a little bit more about that phosphorus story because it's really complex in a way. When plants grow on soil, they deplete the soil of phosphorus. That's why we give them fertilizer. Now, let's say you, you have soya in Brazil, and you bring that soya to our cattle in the Netherlands, which we do a lot. And our cattle eats it and poos out a lot, manure. And it's being given to the land. And also, that rinses off. We also have a lot of fertilizer in our country, and that also rinses off a lot of our phosphorus. And we see it in our waters. We see it as eutrophication in our lakes. So you say, what, what do you mean there is not enough phosphorus? We have a lot of phosphorus. But what we see is that we broke the biogeochemical cycle. And that we don't want to do. The phosphorus prices are, are rock high uh, when you need it a lot. So you saw from 2007 to 2008 a 700% increase in prices. And even at non-monopoly uh, state uh, at this moment, uh, farmers in developing countries uh, cannot afford the prices of these uh, phosphate fertilizers. So why don't we do that in a different way? Without the future of geopolitical tension that occurs that we're going to make a, a war, not because of the oil, but because of a lack of phosphorus. Because there are ideas that we, you know, it may not be that we do not have enough phosphorus, but it's becoming far more expensive to get it out. Okay, so what we need is a different economy. Uh, a linear economy uh, is out. We should forget about that whole thing and become circular, just like nature does. And we can learn from these 3.8 billion years that nature has really just functioned properly without us. So why don't we learn from that and apply it much more? Now, as an ecology, I'm director of the Netherlands Institute of Ecology, that's an academy institute, and we had to put two of our three centers in a new building, and we brought it to the opposite of the camp campus of Wageningen University, because we want to be closer to university. And we thought, well, if we build a new building, why don't we go circular? <clears throat> so at a certain point, I decided to just do it and get everybody's 
in the same direction and try to do it. So I'll give you a little bit of an impression. We moved in this spring and uh, we didn't only want to go circular with respect to materials that we use uh, with heat and cold, but also with the nutrient cycle and getting this precious phosphorus back. So this is the building as you enter it. Um, it's, uh, we have solar energy, we have materials, untreated wood, we have green roofs, experimental roofs, um, healthy materials uh, for our people to work there, beautiful laboratories, um, and it's in a nice place where we respect biodiversity and enhance biodiversity very strongly. We build bat tunnels, old hedges, species um, are brought back that are supposed to be there. Experimental green roofs, like I say, a bee hotel, etc. Anyway, but it was also important to get the phosphorus back. And I think that was the focus of today, what they wanted me to talk about. We're still building on this system. Uh, but if you go to the toilet, that was my joke, 2009. If you come to us, leave something behind, like you do when in China when you go for dinner. It's very impolite because we can use it. Because we can make energy out of our feces. Uh, and there's lots of wonderful phosphorus and nitrogen and potassium in our feces. And of course, in our urine and um, in nature, there is no waste. Yeah? So we should try to eliminate the concept of waste. In nature, there is always something else that uses the exit of something else. And so, in fact, we could do the same thing. So that's what we did. And uh, we have uh, nutrients. We go to the toilet, it goes to a digester, we, it goes after that, the fluid, to an algae bioreactor, we close the nutrient link, uh, it goes on to a halophyte filter and becomes groundwater. We rinse the toilets with groundwater. To show you a little bit what the algae do, our nutrients go into algae bioreactor. Actually, it's very nice, they love that kind of stuff. So they grow and they multiply. And algae are fantastic in many ways, and algae can become all kinds of things. We can give it back to the soil as a kind of fertilizer, but you can also make bioplastic out of it. We were on lowlands, we stood there already with the setup, and we had algae cookies. And people said, well, you can't do that. And I said, no, you can't do that. But in fact, you could actually, but the food chain is too short. But people ate a lot of cookies. It was made of artificial fertilizer. We also do research on water purification by algae. What do they do with our um, medicine, with our metals, with E. coli bacteria? So we have the research uh, in eco-technology uh, combined with Wageningen University also, uh, with our own researchers, with the building. And, uh, well, I think that was the whole story that I just want to show you that, of course, there is a lot of value in what we consider waste, which isn't waste. It's actually a building product for something else. And algae are very valuable. So my idea is that it could be very, I think, good to apply in many buildings, vacuum toilets. Um, don't use a lot of the drinking water that you don't need and uh, mimic nature. And I think there's a lot to say uh, for that as an idea worth spreading. Okay. Thank you.